Hey folks, thanks for stopping by watching Knife Wildlife. Just doing a little bit of work in the backyard today with the Demco 8020.5. That's right. That is our blade for the day that we are going to be looking at. And on the wrist, we're going to be taking a closer look at the Seiko SNZH 53. <music> All right, y'all, the Demco 8020.5 in the pocket today on the wrist, the Seiko s and 53 Why these two? Uh, probably because I kind of kind of like that aquamarine uh, amphibious vibe that both of these give off. It's kind of a cool pairing. So starting with the knife, as always, this is the knife that is probably going to be on everybody's year-end lists as the knife of the year. Um, this is truly an excellent, excellent Excellent knife. Now that said, it's not perfect, and we will get into the flaws uh, that I've experienced at least. Not saying that you will as well. Of course, everybody's mileage varies, but I have had I have noticed a few flaws on it. But first and foremost, let's talk about this blade. This is a fantastic blade shape. This honestly could be my favorite blade shape that I've ever used. I, I really love it. As you can see here, we have a nice flat followed by a, a good section of belly here and a nice acute point that we get from the uh, clip point design here. Now what I like so much about this is that it's reminiscent of traditional clip points that swoop down like you'd see on the Buck 110 or some old cases, uh, you know, traditional knives like that. However, with this, uh, taking this approach of a uh, straight line uh, clip uh, gives it much more of a modern look. I really, really like it a lot. I just think it's a very attractive blade shape. Um, very kind of tough looking, and I, I just, uh, I just really pick up on that uh, on that appearance. I think it looks great. So our steel on offer here is Austin A. This is the annealed version of Austin, and it's a it's a great performer. I think it's a really excellent steel for everyday carry tasks. Um, the edge retention and, and who I would send send you to for edge retention um, studies and stuff like that studies, <laughs> as if we're doing research. Um, I, I would send you to Cedric and Ada Gear and Outdoors. His channel is a treasure trove of information on blade steels and edge retention and toughness and stainlessness. Um, I, I believe on the testing that he did with Austin A, which was on the uh, Cold Steel Spartan, he found that the this steel performed better than VG-10, better than 440C uh, steels like that. Um, better than N690, for example. Uh, so it's a really great option for everyday carry steel. My experience has been that it's a little bit on the more on the tougher side than the uh, edge resistance side, which is A-OK -okay with me. I prefer my blades to have a little bit more toughness because I do tend to use them pretty hard. Um, that said, um, it's still an excellent option for everyday carry. Our blade length is 3.25 inches. That's three and a quarter, which is my, my gosh, that, that's like the perfect everyday carry blade length. I really truly believe that. It's, it's just enough to get any task done that you need to get done. Um, it's not too short, like it's a great length. And it reminds me of um, what makes knives like the Spyderco S110 V Native 5 uh, such perfect everyday carry options. The uh, Benchmade 531 or the Bug Out you could put in here as well as these knives are very closely related. You can see here the blade length on these two is quite similar. Uh, sharpened edge is just a hair longer on the 531, but I mean barely, it's, it's hardly noticeable. Um, but yeah, so that puts this Demco 8020.5 in great company of knives that I think are kind of the perfect summation of what a pocket knife should be. So very high praise in that regard. Our stock thickness is an eighth of an inch. Uh, perfect stock thickness again. Um, I understand some of y'all might want a bit more of a, a slicey thin profile, but uh, I think it's a really well balanced uh, thickness. As you can see, we have a uh, not a shallow flat grind, but also not a high flat grind either. It does have a, a broad shoulder at the top here, but I've been using this uh, for food prep, um, for cardboard cutting, and I I've had no issues with it. It's, it's sliced up just fine. I love that Dimco maker's mark right there at the base of the blade. I think that looks really awesome. We flip this over here, we can see Austin A, and it's made in Taiwan, which is fantastic. Um, Cold Seal, of course, does the majority of their production in Taiwan. Spyderco's highest end offerings come from Taiwan. It's safe to say 
that blades made in Taiwan are coming from a reliable, um, historically awesome <laughs> uh, manufacturing system. Um, so I have no complaints there. As you can see here, we have two methods of deployment. We have a blade slot as well as uh, large thumb, thumb studs. And the thumb studs are very, uh, they're very good. Um, they are, like I said, they are a bit large, but you are not gonna miss them. Uh, they're very easy to activate. Um, plenty of, of area for attack there. Uh, so you can, you can uh, thumb flick it. You can middle finger flick it. Um, you can grab the thumb slot and slow roll, do the same thing with the thumb stud. You can actually remove these thumb studs as well if you just want to use the thumb slot and nothing else. However, I found that I liked thumb studs so much that I, I began to miss them, so I put them back on. Um, but yeah, you can hit, hit uh, both of these quite easily and deploy it. In addition to that, you can also use the shark lock to deploy it. So you pull back on the, on the, uh, on the lock and you'll see it pushes the blade out. Give it a bit of a wrist and it pops right out. So as you can see, quite fidgety. You can also actuate that shark lock with your thumb like this, uh, kind of like as my buddy uh, Wolfman Walsh calls it, he calls it flicking the bick. Um, yeah, you can roll it out like that, roll it back in. So just a, 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 a fidgeter's dream. Um, definitely the most fidgety knife that I own right now. Uh, so it's, it's definitely fantastic in that regard. High marks. Let's take a look at the handle now. Our handle here is very flat uh, very thin. As you can see, it, it definitely emphasizes everyday carry. That's kind of the whole uh, real goal of this knife is being a, a tough, functional everyday carry knife. And the handle absolutely falls into that as well. Uh, the scales are made out of grivery, which is kind of an FRN, you know, like a, a uh, high impact kind of plastic for, you know, for all intents and purposes. Uh, it's very um, ergonomic, very grippy. This texturing is kind of a diamond plate texturing. Uh, for me, more than anything, it reminds me of Spyderco's FRN and their bi-directional texture that they put on there. It's not quite as grippy as that, but it, there's plenty of grip. You're not gonna be losing this thing. Uh, it's gonna feel just fine in hand. Um, ergonomics are, are definitely excellent. Uh, downsides to the ergos. Um, if you're doing a lot of extended cutting, you will begin to feel these, these flat scales in your hand. Um, it's not as comfortable as say like an 8010 would be with its radius contoured handles. We, we have a very flat profile here. So something to keep in mind, but I do think that at the cost of that um, comfortable aspect for extended cutting, you are getting a, a much better profile for EDC. Uh, you do have a bit of a choil up here, but it's kind of a miniature choil. Um, I've cut, do, done some food prep this way. It works just fine, but as you can see, your index finger is quite close to the blade there. Our handle length is four and three eighths inches, and our thickness is four tenths of an inch, so just under half an inch. Uh, really perfect in that regard um, for, for carrying around in your pocket all day. Uh, it's very lightweight, disappears, uh, well, disappears is the wrong word uh, because of this pocket clip. Um, it's definitely not invisible, <laughs> but uh, you do tend to forget it's there. It's, it's that lightweight. Now, uh, speaking of these handles, this brings to mind uh, one issue I found in the handles is that up here at the front, you can see that the scales are pulling away from the liners. Um, th that sucks. <laughs> Let's not beat around the bush here. Like that's definitely a negative. Um, they're not gonna pull off completely because of course they're being held in place by the pivot here and by these three scales, um, excuse me, these three screws, uh, body screws in the back of the handle. However, you can see we have the stop pin here as well as these two uh, locator pins for the shark lock and they are not, obviously they're not screwed in, they just sit uh, flush inside the scales. Um, so that's leading the scales to pull away a little bit. Um, you can definitely get your fingernail in there and you know it, it kind of sits there a little flappy. Um, that said, it's, it, I'm not worried about it. It's not going to pull away completely. Um, I don't think over long, long-term use, I don't think you're going to really see any negatives there. It's just unsightly. Um, definitely a hit on the fit and finish, um, which is, and look, yeah, you can see as it, it widens up here in the middle too, uh, which is a bummer because back here at the backspacer, where the backspacer and the scales meet is perfect. Um, it's nearly invisible and seamless. Um, very impressive there. Backspacer, of course, is also grivery. Um, toward the back of the handle, we have a lanyard hole here that goes through the pocket clip. Really great lanyard hole position, as Dimco always does. Um, 
very functional. I know a lot of you are probably not going to be lanyard hole fans. Um, I do use lanyard, so I'm a pretty big fan of it. But um, still, I don't think you're going to notice that too much. That Now, it is kind of a negative if you're into deep carry clips. Me personally, I'm not. I like being able to access my pocket knife without having to dig into my pocket for it. But I understand if you prefer a deep carry, uh, this is definitely going to be a negative. This kind of <laughs> this kind of funky, gangly clip that we have here. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, take a look at the pocket, and we'll discuss that clip. So I'm wearing shorts today, and as you can see, this doesn't disappear. Uh, it's a very visible knife. Um, that pocket ride is pretty shallow. Um, it, you can see the butt of the blade sticking out quite obviously. That said, it carries very comfortably and uh, it, it, it's, very, it's just so lightweight that you really don't think about it too much. Um, but it's not going to be a quiet, deep carry option. It's going to be very noticeable. That said, I'm quite sure that uh, deep carry uh, options are on the way and the clip slides in and out of the pocket great and it retains very well and I'm, I'm quite confident that if you were running, jumping, uh, hanging upside down in a tree, this is not going to go anywhere. It's, it's very uh, firmly in place. Uh, comes in and out, no problem. So once those deep carry options come by, I'm sure a lot of y'all will be checking those out. Um, but if you're, if, you, if you're okay with shallow carry like I am, it's, it's a good clip. So let's talk about this shark lock. This operates in a way that is functionally similar to a Benchmade Axis lock or a, a Hogue Able lock. Um, in that you have a piece of material that is sitting on top of the blade tang. When you remove that piece of material, the blade can be swung shut. Um, the difference is here, uh, as opposed to the latter two options, which use a bar, a sliding bar, here we have a so, uh, an, another bar that, that's not a horizontal bar that sits on the blade tang, but rather a, a lengthwise bar. When you pull that back, uh, the blade is, or the uh, lock is removed against a flat on the bottom of the knife. And as we can see here, there's a flat right in there on the top of the knife. And we'll see it swing back into place over that flat. There you go. So it's not quite as, I'm guessing it's not as strong as a triad lock. Now, it, it, some, some testing could disprove my theory, and it might be stronger. Um, however, on a triad lock, the lock bar sort of wedges uh, the stop pin between the blade and the lock bar itself, so you have added strength. Here our stop pin is simply acting as a stop pin. If you guys know, um, or if you've had further experience, feel free to comment and let me know uh, the durability of this lock. I imagine it's plenty strong though. I'm not worried about strength issues with it. Um, but it is a little bit more favoring the fidgety side of things versus the long-term durability side of things. But that said, there's, you're, you're not going to have, as long as you treat this knife like you would treat any other pocket knife, um, you're not going to have any issues with the, with the lock. Um, it's very sturdy. No side-to-side -side play. No vertical play. Um, just a very well-designed lock. Uh, very fidgety. One of the fidgetiest locks, even more so than the Axis lock for me, because you can grab it with your thumb like this, pull it down, let it go. You can grab it with your index finger, let it go, uh, and it just snaps right into place, similar to the way that the axis lock works. Another thing I noticed is that with time, the spring that is inside of this lock, which is, if I haven't mentioned already, this is called the shark lock. You can kind of see why you've got kind of a bit of a little shark fin here. Um, the spring that sits in the, inside there will, uh, after a while, it will get very squeaky. Um, you can remedy that by uh, dousing it. I basically open the knife up, and I drop some mineral oil in here and just let it soak for a little bit and then that gets rid of that squeak. And the second issue that I want to talk about, when you have your thumb up here in this position, you see how your thumb rests on the shark lock. Uh, not only is that not super comfortable, you can also nudge the lock a little bit. Now not enough for it to come unlocked. However, the problem is you see when you're bearing down, you'll, you'll feel it I can do this right now where if I, I just hit it just right, the blade uh, jiggles a little bit up and down. That's not vertical play. Um, the blade's locked up tight when your hands are off of that lock. However, when you put pressure on it, it'll move just a bit. You'll, you'll feel the blade wiggle underneath your thumb. Now when you choke up, uh, my hand at least does not even hit that lock. So in the choked up position, you don't really notice that. It, it feels great, nice and locked up. Back here, 
if you're going to be cutting like that, you're probably best off doing this and putting your thumb on the lock. Now it's not gonna go anywhere. But I just wanted to make sure you guys were aware of that little issue there. Not, a, not necessarily a, a, a fault of the knife, it's just the way it's designed, uh, the way that lock is designed. And here's our packaging for the knife. Uh, very, very nice zip pouch. Again, these are coming in at about 150, 160. I, I think you're getting quite a bit for your money here. Um, so this, uh, this pouch is really nice. It's got a shark lock patch up here on the top. Um, you, can, you can actually pull that off and, and put it wherever you want. Um, sometimes they'll come with a sticker, but not all the time. But the, the sticker is basically identical to the patch, uh, I think, except it's in white. Um, we open this up here. It also comes with a, a cloth right here in this pocket, which I don't have in here right now. Um, the blade is, is usually delivered up here in this pocket. And in this Velcro pocket here, we have a clip for the left side of the knife. So you lefties are taken care of. And that brings me to another point is that this knife with its clip is uh, fully ambidextrous. So depending on how you want to carry it, you can pretty much do whatever you want with it. Left hand carry, right hand carry, no problems. So I always like to show off the packaging that a knife comes with and I love seeing uh, packaging like this. On to our watch now. Uh, this is going to be a little bit more of a long-term review actually. I've had this watch a very long time and I've never really talked about it too much on video. I'm sure you guys, uh, if you've watched any of my older series like Takedown Talk, I'm sure you've seen me wearing it from time to time, but uh, this is my Seiko s and 53 uh, I nicknamed it Big Blue and I really love this watch. It was my first automatic and I, I got it when I found out that my wife and I were having a son, so it has a lot of sentimental value to me. Um, and it has really uh, stood the test of time and to this day, it's still one of my favorite EDC watches. Uh, very functional, very useful. As I said it before, it's an automatic movement. It uses the Seiko movement, the 7S36B, which is an evolution of the 7S26 used in watches uh, from Seiko, uh, such as the uh, SKX007, SKX009 as well, I believe. Very, uh, very um, tested tried and true movement and then it has been for me on this one and I've actually dropped this watch I know this is anecdotal but you're just gonna have to trust me I dropped this watch from about three feet onto a tile floor face down and I've had no negative repercussions from the movement and that was years ago and it's still just ticking along um, that said uh, there are some issues with it there's no hand winding there's no hacking so to wind this watch you basically have to do the old Seiko shuffle and just sit here and shake the watch to wind it um, we do have a display case back so you guys can see the movement here. Uh, very utilitarian, no decoration of any kind really. Uh, but for a watch like this, uh, that's all you need. Um, it, it really is an excellent first automatic watch. Um, or honestly, it's, a, it's, it's an excellent, uh, only, like uh, if this is the only watch you wanted to use, that it would be an excellent option for that as well. Um, the, it's a three hertz movement. So as you can see here, it's not the perfect sweep that you're going to get from a high-end 4 hertz movement like you'd see in some Etta's or Rolex or, uh, or Swiss Tech or you know uh, uh, manufacturers like that but again it's how often are you sitting there counting each individual tick um, you're really not going to notice it too much unless you just sit there and, and you're timing it and you're staring at the second hand that's really the only time you're going to notice it uh, as you can see we have a day date complication very useful on this one in particular um, this is a K series so it comes with English and Spanish and I just keep it on the Spanish for fun. Um, the J series version of this watch is English and Arabic, I believe, which is kind of cool. Love seeing um, options in languages for the day date. The bezel here is pretty good. Um, again, this is this being a Seiko 5, which is supposed to be affordable, it's not the ratchetiest bezel in the world. It's quite smooth, um, a little bit nutty, as uh, Minute Watch would say. Um, but it's still great. Um, definitely a lot of back play. You can see there's, there's quite a bit of play here. Um, it's an easy watch to mod though, which is why I like it so much. And this bezel is not, the bezel is factory, the bezel itself. The insert, however, is not factory. This is a ceramic insert from Mueller and Sons. You can get these on eBay for about 60 bucks. And in my opinion, it is much more attractive than the stock bezel. Now the, st the stock bezel insert. Now that bezel insert's great too. However, it's um, a, a clear mineral crystal, crystal with, a, uh, with, the, with the numbers and the uh, hash marks mounted behind it. Um, I kind of prefer the ceramic look where they're immediately at the top. Um, definitely has reminiscences of the Blancpain 
uh, 50 fathoms, um, which has led to some people to completely mod these to look like 50 fathoms and call them 55 fathoms as a nod to the fact that it's a Seiko 5. Um, but yes, overall, just it's, it's an awesome little watch. So let's talk about the dimensions here. Um, case size from here to here, 42 millimeters. We have a lug to lug size of 45 millimeters, very compact. So if you're like me, you have a smaller size wrist, this is an excellent option uh, to have a bigger face um, that still fits a small size wrist. Really great. Seiko's very good about those short um, lug to lug distances. Our lug width is 22 millimeters. I wish it was 20 instead, but you know what, 22 is just fine. You're gonna have plenty of strap options, which brings me to the stock strap. It's not a strap at all, it is a bracelet, and it's not a great bracelet. Um, I'll, I'll put in a photo actually right here of what the stock version of this watch looks like, which will also include the stock bezel. Now that said, I, I suggest uh, taking that bracelet off because it is chunky, a little bit rattly. It's just, it's not an elegant bracelet at all. Hollow, uh, not obviously hollow links, but they are hollow. Uh, so it, it is a bit, it's just not, not a great bracelet. I got this Benchmark Basics sailcloth strap from Amazon for $19 and it is fantastic. It is a really well-made strap for the money. Uh, there really aren't a lot of sailcloth options out there, um, and I think for the money, this one's great. It has a few issues. Um, there are some rough spots on the edges, um, but other than that, I think it's very forgivable, forgivable for the quality for what you're getting. It's also quick release, as you can see by these pins here. You just pull them back, and the strap will pop right out. So I think that's an excellent option if you're looking for straps for this watch, and it also adds to that blanc pong look. Um, with the with the sailcloth. We have a thickness here of 14 millimeters and that is slightly added to by this domed hard lex crystal on top. Hard lex is of course Seiko's uh, proprietary crystal and I've never had too many negative issues with it. It does scratch up pretty readily. Um, my scratches are so minute you probably won't see them on this camera um, but they are there trust me. Uh, however it doesn't really detract. Um, yeah it'd be great with sapphire but I mean, this, is, this watch is right now trending for 200 to 230. It's understandable why there wouldn't be sapphire there. Um, but uh, that, domed, that domed appearance is, is wonderful. You can see it occlude and play with the light, uh, especially for the fact that it is a um, sunburst dial. It's a faint sunburst, but it's still a sunburst. So it's, you can see my thumbprints there. Sorry about that, guys. But you can see how it really plays with the light quite a lot with that double dome. And I just love that occlusion when you look at it on an angle. Uh, so yeah, a lot to love here, a lot of charm, a lot of personality. Um, the loom on our dial here is Seiko's Lumabrite. It is not very generously applied, uh, so do not expect this thing to be a nightlight. It is not. The crown is a simple push-pull crown. Uh, pulls out all the way out to set the time. One, one click out to set the day and date. Uh, as you can see, as I mentioned earlier, that second hand does not hack, which, which admittedly, that, that sucks. Um, but again, uh, I, I can forgive it just for the cool factor of this watch. Uh, last little stat here, our water resistance is 100 meters. So this really is more of a dive style watch than an actual dive watch. Um, but that said, it's, it's fine. You can go swimming with it. I swim with it all the time. Uh, I've never had any negative re repercussions. I do dive, and I will not take this watch on a dive. I don't think it can withstand that. Um, but for everything during your everyday life, this thing is going to be just fine. And here's a shot of the watch on my small size wrist. Um, as you can see, it's, it's large on my wrist, but it's not too large that I can't wear it. Um, it sits, sits very well, a little bit chunky, but I do really like that chunky look. Um, personally, I think it, it, as far as the dive aesthetic goes, it, it really has a cool... Uh, uh, very tool oriented kind of look to it and man that strap just adds so much value to this watch um, so yeah that is the, the wrist shot here for the SNZH so thank you so much guys for joining me today here on Watch and Knife Wildlife we looked at the Dimco 80 20.5 and the Seiko SNZH 53 two excellent everyday carry options both of which are fairly affordable this guy coming in at 150 to 160 when you can get it now granted, um, these are coming in and out of stock very fast, but if you're waiting for one, just get on one of the email lists for the retailers that I will link below. Eventually it will come back into stock. 
Uh, this one is readily available, however, it's sitting around uh, 200 to 230. When I got mine, they were 150, so it's quite a price jump, but they are kind of a, a uh, popular watch, so it's, it's not that surprising. And I still think it's a good value at 200. 230 is a bit high for this. Um, but that said, thank you guys so much. Any questions, comments, any opinions that you want to share, please post them down below. And uh, if you enjoyed this, please consider liking and subscribing. All right, see you later, guys.